To make a donation, visit biblicallycorrectpodcast.org slash donate. And if you enjoy this episode, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Thank you for your support. What does Judaism get wrong about Passover? Welcome to the Biblically Correct Podcast. Shalom, y'all. This is the Biblically Correct Podcast, teaching biblical correctness in a biblically incorrect world. My name is Kevin Jeffrey. I'm a Jewish follower of the Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, and I love teaching the scriptures. Of all the watershed moments in Israel's history, the exodus from Egypt is not only the most well-known, but possibly the most defining. Not only did it mark the beginning of the fulfillment of God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the inauguration of God's purpose for the people of Israel, and, though they didn't know it, the reconciliation of the whole world to their one true creator. It's no wonder, then, that Passover is perhaps the most widely observed Jewish holiday, carrying with it thousands of years of history and rich tradition. And yet, most of what's typically observed today in the central ceremony of Passover, the Passover Seder, isn't biblical. Despite any modern innovations and adaptations, including messianic ones, most of the elements of the Passover Seder, as long established by post-temple rabbinic Judaism, have zero basis in Scripture. It brings me no joy to say this because it puts me at odds with my heritage, my community, and my people. But what does bring me joy is the pure Word of God, which I believe with my whole being is what truly defines how we're to behave as God's people, not the writings or traditions of man. So today I want to look at what Judaism gets wrong about Passover, really what most everyone gets wrong who has a Passover Seder. But I want you to understand that I'm not doing this to pick on or put down Judaism or Jewish tradition, but rather to elevate the scriptures. My desire is for my fellow Jews, as well as everyone who follows the Messiah, to be a scriptural people. Because when it comes to the Torah and God's appointed times especially, I take extremely seriously Moses' admonition in Deuteronomy 4.2. Do not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor diminish from it. That's why I believe that even seemingly harmless, ascriptural traditions deserve scrutiny and that we need to know what is and is not commanded by God, not only so that we may do what he says, but so that we will not walk contrary to his word. There's actually so much that Judaism teaches in regard to Passover that I can't cover it all today. So I'm just going to focus on the main part of Passover that most people participate in, and that's the Seder, specifically the use of food. So let's start by familiarizing ourselves with those elements of the Seder table. The word Seder means order, as in order of service. Then we'll talk about what Judaism says about each one, followed by what the scriptures say. You with me? Okay, here we go. The main feature of the Seder table is the Seder plate, which is divided into seven sections for holding the symbolic food items. Six areas around the outside of the plate and one area in the center. The six elements that are always on the plate are the following. The shank bone of a lamb, sometimes a chicken bone is used. The bitter herb, which is usually horseradish. One roasted hard-boiled egg. Some parsley or other green vegetable. A second bitter herb, usually romaine lettuce. And the haroset, which is a sweet apple or fruit and nut mixture. Also on the table is a container of salt water, which some households place in the center of the Seder plate. Alternatively, the center will hold the matzah, the unleavened bread, which is one of the main elements of the Seder. And finally, to drink the fruit of the vine, usually wine or grape juice. The purpose of the plate is to represent certain aspects of Passover and to provide the elements for creating a sensory experience as part of the telling of the Passover story. This, of course, is the whole point of the Passover Seder. And the Haggadah, the book that's read during the Seder, directs the participants to observe and use the elements of the table as the recounting unfolds. So let's first look at the elements of the Seder plate. And I'd like to begin with the bitter herbs. You'll understand shortly why I'm starting here. So presumably because the word in scripture for bitter herbs is plural, there are two spots on the Seder plate to represent these. 
And again, it's usually horseradish and romaine lettuce. In the Seder, Judaism says that the bitter herbs are used to symbolize the bitterness and hardship of slavery that Israel endured while in Egypt. Though there isn't actually a scriptural reason given for the bitter herbs, nor do the scriptures specify which bitter herbs to use, they are clearly commanded as part of the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, which says to eat the Passover with bitter herbs. So on the Seder plate, the bitter herbs occupy two spaces out of the six, and that is the end of the scriptural elements of the Seder plate. That's it. Everything else is 100% an invention of Judaism. Now, that doesn't mean that it's all automatically bad, but it does mean that when the Seder plate is used to tell the Passover story, it's because tradition says to use it, not God. You're not doing what the Torah says to do, and you're definitely not doing what Yeshua did for Passover. You're doing something that was completely invented by man, which by definition has the potential to stray from the truth. So keeping that in mind, let's continue to explore the Seder plate. Next up is the shank bone. This bone isn't used to tell the story, but is there to represent the Passover sacrifice itself, which is one lamb or goat per household. It's represented on the plate rather than actually killed and eaten because there's only one place in the world where God says Israel is permitted to make that sacrifice. And according to Deuteronomy 16 and 1 Kings 11, that's Jerusalem. And of course, the tradition of the shank bone was developed by a Judaism in dispersion. I would call this element quasi-scriptural because it does represent the Passover sacrifice, which is obviously commanded in Exodus 12 and elsewhere. I don't really feel the need to belabor this as being an uncommanded element because for the more than half of all the Jews around the world, we're still not in Jerusalem for the feast. But I will say this, what about those who are now in Jerusalem? Well, one could argue that the sacrifice still can't be made because there's no standing temple or operating priesthood. But while we do see late instances of the Passover sacrifices being handled at the temple by the priests, as in 2 Chronicles 35, that's actually not what the Torah tells us to do. The Torah says that each household was to set aside, kill, cook, and eat the sacrifice themselves. So, only for those who are actually in Jerusalem for the feast could any issue really be taken with the shank bone as a mere remembrance of the sacrifice. Going back now to the concept that Judaism assigns to the bitter herbs, adjacent to these in terms of storytelling is the salt water. During the Seder, one dips into and then tastes the salt water, which Judaism says represents the tears that Israel shed from their mistreatment and slavery. And again, this isn't commanded or indicated anywhere in Scripture. The salt water is basically just used as a storytelling device. It isn't particularly notorious, just not scriptural. This is similar in function and use to the next item, the charoset. Judaism says that this sweet apple and nut mixture, sort of like a paste, represents the mortar that Israel used in their forced construction work for Egypt. Again, this element isn't commanded anywhere in Scripture, but is used in contrast with the salt water and bitter herbs to tell the story. There are two more items on the Seder plate, the parsley and the roasted egg. And here's where things start to take a bit of a turn. As with most things in Judaism, ask two Jews where a Passover tradition comes from, and you get three opinions. So when you look for an explanation of how a tradition came to be or why it's done, no one really knows. So they become infused with meaning that definitely doesn't come from scripture and may have nothing at all to do with their actual origins, origins which may not be all that innocent. Take the parsley or green vegetable, for example, which during the Seder is dipped into the salt water and then eaten. Some say dipping the parsley represents freedom because dipping food was once considered a luxury. Others say that the parsley represents Joseph's coat of many colors and therefore how Israel first came to live in Egypt and were fruitful in the land. And others still say that the parsley represents springtime, which is the time of year in which Passover takes place and that eating the parsley with the salt water together represents Israel's tears mixed with the hope of new birth. 
And while all these explanations are interesting, this last one I find the most concerning. Yes, Passover occurs in the spring, right after the beginning of the year. But where does the idea to celebrate springtime come from? Certainly not the Bible. So what would inspire that concept of springtime to be made part of the Passover Seder? Let's hold that thought. Finally, the roasted egg is probably the strangest element of all. Like the shank bone, it's not really used to tell the story, but it's supposed to represent the additional sacrifices done at the temple during the feast days. So why would a chicken, much less a chicken egg, represent a sacrifice? Neither chickens nor eggs are ever acceptable as a temple sacrifice to God. Some say the egg is also a symbol of mourning over the loss of the temple, which prevents the prescribed sacrifices from being made. The egg is apparently a traditional food of mourning. And some say the egg represents the cycle of life, since the shape of the egg has no beginning and no end. And now we're starting to go kind of sideways on all this. Like the idea of celebrating springtime with the parsley, we don't see anything about commemorating the cycle or renewal of life in the Bible. So where could it come from? Well, according to George Robinson in his book, Essential Judaism, he says of the Seder elements, their relevance to the agricultural aspects of a major spring festival are self-evident. The greens for the arrival of spring, the egg a symbol of fertility and renewal. Now, does that sound scriptural to you? Why would we want a fertility symbol on our Seder plate? Now again, we don't know for sure how the egg came to be in the Seder and what it actually means. But of all the things it's said to stand for, this one could be the most likely. Especially when you consider that another religion's major spring holiday that occurs every year near Passover and was actually invented by Christians as a replacement for Passover also prominently features the hiding and finding and painting of eggs. Why would a springtime holiday meant to celebrate the resurrection of the Messiah include the use of eggs? Well, I'm suggesting that it may be for the same reason that there's an egg on the Seder plate. Because somewhere along the way, superstitious or pagan ideas and practices became intermingled with the various faith traditions. Both Christianity and Judaism have been influenced in this way. And before you think I'm way off base on this, let's consider the fruit of the vine and the part of the Seder where Judaism says we're to dip our fingers in the cup and then let the wine drop from our finger. Well, according to Rabbi Alfred Kolach, who wrote The Jewish Book of Why, he says this, Why is wine spilled from the cup when the ten plagues is recited? Many early societies believed that evil spirits could be bribed with wine. Accordingly, some wine was always spilled from the cup before any of the wine in that cup was drunk. In his book, Kolach notes all kinds of Jewish traditions that may have their origins in superstitious or pagan beliefs, including the breaking of the glass at weddings, the bride circling the groom, the waving of the lulav at Sukkot, the Star of David, and much more. So could paganism or mysticism or superstition be the origin of how the wine is used this way in the Seder? Who knows? But the problem is this. However you get there, whether it's the parsley, the egg, the wine, or any of the other elements, it wasn't because God said to go there. Somebody invented it. And the inspiration for that invention could be completely innocent or the result of influence by cultural superstitions or false pagan and anti-biblical beliefs. When we have the word of God to follow, why would we even take a chance with traditions of unknown or questionable origins? Think about that. Now, the last thing on the Seder table I want to talk about today is the matzah or unleavened bread. Obviously, matzah is central not only to Passover, but the whole following week of the feast that it's named for. And just like the Passover lamb and the bitter herbs, it's the third part of the commanded Passover meal, as it says in Exodus 12.8. Eat the Passover with matzah. Now, I could do a whole teaching on matzah like how Judaism says kosher for Passover matzah can only contain flour and water. 
That's why it tastes so bland. Or how the whole batch has to be cooked within 18 minutes, or it will spontaneously leaven. There's lots of fun stuff to talk about with regard to matzah. But right now, I want to focus on just one aspect of it, which is how Judaism uses an alleged technicality to justify what I believe is a violation of Scripture. So the Torah commanding leaven during Passover and the Feast of Matzah couldn't be clearer. Exodus 12.15 says, Seven days you will eat only matzot. On the first day, remove leaven from your houses. For anyone eating anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, even that person must be cut off from Israel. So very explicitly, the scriptures say that we may not eat anything leavened. That is, any food that's been leavened, typically with yeast. That's basically why matzah is flat and leavened bread is big and fluffy. The fermentation process from leaven causes the dough to rise and expand. And this is what completely blows my mind because I can't for the life of me figure out how any observant Jew could come up with this and think it's okay. I'm talking about kosher for Passover cake mixes. I mean, this stuff has been rabbinically certified as okay to eat during Passover. Let's take a look at the ingredients for the Manischewitz Extra Moist Chocolate Cake Mix with frosting. It's got sugar, cake meal, which it says is ground matzah made from Passover wheat flour and water. So the main part of the mix is actually matzah. It's totally unleavened flour. Then there's palm oil, cocoa powder, potato starch, modified tapioca starch, salt, and sodium bicarbonate. That's baking soda, ladies and gentlemen. Baking soda is a leavening agent that chemically causes exactly what yeast naturally does. When you bake it in a cake mix like this one, it produces carbon dioxide bubbles in the unleavened flour, causing it to rise and expand, making the, quote, kosher for Passover cake leavened. Now, even if I were to accept the idea that chemical leaveners technically aren't leaven, look at what you get as a result. That's not matzah. That's clearly a bread product that has risen due to the leavening process. If that's not a violation of the letter of the law, it's certainly a violation of the spirit of the law and may very well make that person worthy of being cut off from Israel. Believe me, there are a lot less dangerous ways to have a delicious unleavened dessert for Passover. Why risk it on a technicality? So let's put all this together. The Passover Seder, as developed by Rabbinic Judaism, is the heart and soul of nearly every modern Passover Seder, including Messianic and Christian celebrations. At the center of the Seder is the retelling of the Passover story, which uses the various elements of the Seder plate and Seder table to create a sensory experience. But with the exception of the matzah and bitter herbs, not a single element on the Seder plate is indicated or commanded in Scripture by God. And the origins and uses of those elements range from the benign to the questionable to the probably pagan, with an optional dessert that's almost certainly unbiblical. Yet for all the innovation and invention of Judaism and the adaptations and additions of Christians and Messianic Jews, the fundamental Torah concerning Passover, Pesach, remains strikingly simple. And they will take to themselves each man a lamb to each house. And on the fourteenth day of this month, slaughter it between the evenings. And they must eat the meat during this night, roasted with fire. They must eat it with matzot and merorim, bitter herbs. And it will have come to pass when your sons say to you, What is this ceremony you have? That you must say, It is a sacrifice of Pesach to Adonai, who had passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Mitzrayim, in his striking the Mitzrayim, and our houses he had delivered. Exodus chapter 12. These are the only ingredients commanded and necessary for keeping the Passover. The matzah, the bitter herbs, the telling of the story, and the Passover lamb, a sacrifice which Torah forbids us to make anywhere but Jerusalem. And that is perhaps the biggest thing that Judaism and nearly everyone else gets wrong about Passover. The Passover Seder isn't Passover, 
because there is no Passover without the lamb. Without the killing of that specially selected lamb at sundown on the 14th day, we're missing the main ingredient. And no matter what we do to represent that sacrifice or to embellish the telling, we're left with only an incomplete memorial. Perhaps this reality is implicitly confessed in the closing words of the Seder next year in Jerusalem. But the good news is, especially as followers of Yeshua, we aren't at a complete loss with only having a memorial. Because as Paul teaches, even if we're not in Jerusalem, we can still keep the feast. Paul says this to the believers in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new batch of dough because you are unleavened. For our Pesach, Messiah, was also sacrificed so that we may keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the matzah of purity and truth. Here's what I believe is an appropriate memorial of the Passover and a scriptural alternative to the rabbinic Passover Seder. One, in your home, share a meal with family and friends. Make it as simple or as elaborate as you want. Include matzah and bitter herbs, and if you like, you can even have some lamb. The Master Yeshua also included the fruit of the vine. Two, tell the story of how God delivered Israel from slavery. Read it directly from the book of Exodus, say it in your own words, even use the matzah and bitter herbs to tell it if you want. But however you do it, recount it simply, based on the scriptures, and do it as an act of sharing the history of God's people with the next and future generations. And three, remember and celebrate Yeshua as the embodiment and fulfillment of the Pesach. When you break and share the matzah, remember his body that he gave for you and how the Lamb of God, through that selfless and perfect sacrifice, also made you unleavened. And if you feel like you want to or need a guide to help you have this kind of scripture-based Passover memorial, you can also use Perfect Word's untraditional Messianic Passover Haggadah, Behold the Lamb, which is literally about 90% of nothing but the written Word of God. What Judaism gets wrong about Passover is what we all get wrong in nearly every area of life. Forgetting to stick close to the scriptures, swerving to the left and the right, adding our own ideas on top of or in place of God's, and burying the pure and simple truth of his word. So this year for Passover, don't default to tradition and the way things have always been done, but return to the perfect word of God. Because even though we can only remember the Pesach, still we can scripturally keep the feast. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Biblically Correct Podcast. If you like this episode and want to see us make more, then we need your help. Visit our website at biblicallycorrectpodcast.org to support the work of Perfect Word Ministries and MJMI with your much-needed donations. And of course, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell to receive notifications whenever a new episode is posted. If you have any questions about this teaching, or if there are any other topics you'd like to see me cover, leave me a comment or shoot me an email at kevin at perfectword.org. That's kevin at perfectword.org. Until next time, Remember that every scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for refuting, for setting a right, and for instruction that is in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully equipped, having been completed for every good act. Shalom.